Hello. This is the thought for the day for Friday the 4th of December. And the passage comes from Revelation chapter 21, starting at verse 22. And it goes like this. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honour of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter into it, nor anyone who practises abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night, they will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign there for ever and ever. I've often thought it's strangely ironic that this book of the Bible, which is called Revelation, doesn't seem revelatory at all. It's actually a really difficult book, full of obscure symbolism and bizarre imagery. But it is important to understand it for what it is. John wrote it when the Romans were increasingly trying to silence the Christians, insisting that they worship the emperor rather than Jesus Christ. And John himself was exiled on the island of Patmos, probably in a Roman prison camp. So this is his cry to his fellow Christians to hold to their faith, to look to the future. And he writes of his passionate vision of the path to a better world in which good ultimately triumphs over evil. This passage, which is almost the final page of the Bible, follows the earlier part of the chapter in which John speaks of the new heaven and the new earth. In doing so, he picks up several of the images which we have been seeing in his gospel in the I Am sayings of Jesus, notably that of light. In this section, we move to the holy city itself, the new Jerusalem, which is portrayed majestically as a city of eternal light and absolute purity. Many years ago, a Victorian clergyman is supposed to have said that his idea of heaven was eating pâté de foie gras to the sound of trumpets. I've always had a problem with that because I don't much like pâté, and I think listening to trumpets for eternity would be intolerable. Similarly, it's hard to imagine ever living in a city for all time, and particularly one where it is permanently day. Think of a world with no countryside, no twilight, no dawn. But I think we need to allow the writers, both the Victorian clergyman and John himself, some poetic license. The vision that they are conveying is a glorious and wonderful vision, not a literal portrayal, but the idea of something grand and far beyond our imagining. So what is the vision of the heavenly city? There is no temple, which would be unthinkable to a Jewish person. But there's no temple because there's no further need of sacrifice, no need of a temple for God to live in, because we are in the presence of God. Nor is there any sun or moon, because Christ, here portrayed as the Lamb, is triumphant, and with God himself is the source of all light, permanently, forever. There is also water, as in the Garden of Eden, a river, crystal clear, flows through the city. And again, as in the Garden of Eden, there is a tree, 
one bearing fruit all year. So everything is provided. So how do we take this? What does it mean for us today? Well, I find it compels me as a vision of absolute purity. Yes, perhaps it seems intimidating and a bit austere to us, like one of those perfect designer houses where one can't imagine wearing scruffy old clothes or muddy shoes. But perhaps that is the point. We live in a grubby world, grubby morally, grubby politically, grubby economically. And we're surrounded by what Paul calls deeds of darkness. So we are naturally wary of a searching light. What would a searching light reveal in us? Yet God's standards are absolute, and one day we can be washed clean enough to join him in his world of light, the one he has prepared for us, if we accept his invitation. Does it sound a bit scary? Will everything be a bit too bright, too loud, too serious? Well, I will end with a musical thought from Karl Barth, the 20th century Swiss theologian. He said that in heaven, when the angels sing for God, they sing Bach, serious stuff. But when they sing for themselves, they sing Mozart, much more friendly. But God listens in at the door. May you have a day full of light and perhaps some Mozart as well. <laughs>